to be a writer, or I was a very avid reader as a girl, but I wanted to be a ballerina, which Flynn, who knows me well from years back, is familiar with since her daughter too wanted to be a ballerina, and that's how we knew each other. But we were more serious than many, Colette and I. Uh, I took, when, by the time I was in high school, I was taking class every day. I lived in Brooklyn and I came into the city and sometimes took two classes a day. So it was, it was a very, you know, devoted kind of apprenticeship. And when I reached, oh, I don't know, 16, 17, I realized that this was not going to be a life I could really pursue, that I was neither good enough nor driven enough. I might not have said that to myself. I don't know that I had the kind of self-awareness, but looking back, it's clear to me that I knew that about myself. So I went off to college, and I left my, I hung up my ballet shoes. Um, I came to regret, but not yet. Not, not when I was in college. In, in college, I immersed myself in any number of things, none of them writing. Didn't just, I, I think I was a little frightened of it. I had a father who was a writer, and I was perhaps intimidated. But um, I studied a number of other things, and I majored in art history. I was at Vassar, which was a lovely place to study, lovely place to do anything, but a particularly lovely place to study art history, and had a fabulous department. And um, I described the experience of going to school there as having been a African violet, over which one's professors hovered like this and said, grow, grow, grow. <laughs> that there was such attention paid, there was no, it was, not, it was a college and not a university, so that all the attention of the professors was on the undergraduates, and I was a very lucky beneficiary of this. So uh, after college, I really had no idea what, I, or I should say when I came to the end of my college years, I had no idea what I was going to do next, but I thought, well, since I like this, and this, you know, I seem to be good at it, and you know, people told me that I was. I would just do more of same. So I went off to graduate school at Columbia, and everything I loved about being a student as an undergraduate was notably absent in my life as a graduate student. It was big, it was impersonal. My professors acted like my concerns were um, annoying, you know, that they had their own research to pursue, and that, you know, teaching me was something, sort of a necessary evil they had to do, but nothing that they enjoyed or welcomed in. You know, and that, that sort of permeated the culture there. You'd go into the library and you'd ask the librarian for help getting a book, and these were not open stacks in this library. And he'd go, oh, would you do this to your new summer coming in? You know, like, <laughs> like this was a big imposition. You know, or as I hadn't asked him to make me, make me lunch, or, you know, <laughs> I just wanted help with a book. So, I, and I noticed that all the other students in my program had briefcases. So I thought, that's the trick. Get a briefcase, and then you two will feel, you know, like you're with the program. So I got a briefcase, a very expensive, snappy leather briefcase with all kinds of things in it, on it, and the briefcase did no good. It just did not, it just did not turn me into a budding art historian. However, the one good thing that Columbia did for me was that while I was a student there, I was allowed to take courses anywhere else in the university without paying an additional charge. So kind of on a whim, I took a fiction writing class. And that was how I had what I guess Oprah would call the aha moment. Like everything kind of shifted, you know, in place. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I, you know, I want to make a life doing this. And now I just have to find a way to do it. So I left Columbia after an MA, although I had been enrolled as a PhD student. But I did feel, oh, I spent all this, you know, I was already in debt so deeply that I might as well get an MA out of it. So I did that. And then I embarked on you know, what I thought would be a writer's life, and I really had no idea how to do that. I know that people, you know, pursue MFAs, and I think if I would, had not done the MA in art history, and I was not so deeply in debt, I might have looked to that as an option, but I was, and I didn't. So I just found, you know, a series of really kind of uninteresting jobs, but I was writing all the time, and I did take some classes in extension programs at um, the new school and at NYU, where one could do that sort of thing, and, you know, meet other people with similar passions and goals. So that was very useful. And then in the meantime, I just kept trying to write anything and everything that I could, you know, for, for hire. Any sort of um, annual report from a bank or book review or anything that anybody would pay me to write. And in the beginning, they didn't pay me to write it. I had to write it and then get some clips and then eventually was able to be paid for it. And as of 1987, um, I, that was the last salary job I had. I was able to make enough of a living doing this, and I kept writing fiction. I was not a, uh, let's see, like a, you know, a 
Dickin on the scene. I didn't publish my first novel until I was 45, which is kind of old for doing that, but I was very glad to have done it. And interestingly enough, it was a novel called The Four Temperaments. I don't know if anybody is aware of that reference, but there's a very famous Balanchine ballet called The Four Temperaments. And the novel took place in New York and was about a ballet dancer. And the violinist who falls in love with her, who happens to be married to someone else, and she falls in love with his son, who's also married to someone else. So there are a lot of complications. But in that book, I found myself returning to this life I had as a young woman, you know, as an aspiring dancer, in a way that was so gratifying. Um, I like to say that among the many things that fiction does for us is that it's a kind of uh, redemption. And it allows you to reclaim, well, it allows you to to claim anything you never had, anything you wanted and never had, and reclaim anything you ever lost and continue to pine for. Mm -hmm. And there's, this is a deeply meaningful way to spend one's life, is all I can say, that I got to revisit that in a way that I didn't expect to and um, didn't anticipate, but it, I was very happy to do that. And that book was followed by a, a second, In Dahlia's Wake, that came out in 2005, and then Breaking the Bank, in 2009, and then finally, um, Wedding and Great Night that just came out last month from New American Library. And um, I will say a little bit about that book, and a little bit about Great Neck, because particularly in Long Island, when I've talked about it, people want to say, well, you know, what's the connection? I didn't grow up there. I grew up in Brooklyn, and then lived in Manhattan. And even though I'm told that Brooklyn is Long Island, technically, it didn't feel like it to me. I had a very urban upbringing. My parents never owned a car. We always lived in an apartment. So I did not feel, you know, I was using the subway by the time I was 12 by myself. So I did not feel um, like I had you know, that suburban connection, at least as far as my, my own upbringing is concerned. Um, I, the way I begin to work as, as a novelist is not from ideas or not from a place, but from a voice that starts talking to me. And I swear, I hear this voice as if it's a real person. And they are tapping me on the shoulder very urgently and saying, I want you to listen to this. It's really important. And what you have to do is get it down right. I feel like someone is telling me a story. And in the best of those moments, I am not so much a creator as a conduit for something else that I can't, I can't say where it comes from and how it comes to me, but I feel very lucky to have it come to me. But then once I hear that, I have to locate that voice in time and space and you know, put it somewhere. And then the other voices start coming too, the other voices in that character's life. So I knew that what the, the character that came to me in this book, it's told in multiple points of view, five, although none of them are the bride herself. I, her parents are represented, her divorced parents, her grandmother, her older sister, and her niece, but not the bride. I kind of wanted her to be the object through which everyone else projected their various thoughts, but she was not going to be the subject of this story, even though she's the impetus for it. Her wedding, because the book takes place in a day at her wedding. So once I had the first voice, which was her father's, who um, he was, he, he's divorced, he's a former alcoholic, he kind of went down as his ex-wife went up. She's the one who married up to Great Neck. He kind of went down in his life. And I needed a place to put it, you know, to put all of them. And since Great Neck was a place I had visited, I have a very close friend who grew up there, and the book is in fact dedicated to her. So I had visited there, and I at least could, um, you know, I knew the names of some of the streets, I knew what the houses looked like. I had a house in mind for the house in which this was going to take place. And, you know, well, I mean, certainly research can fill in those gaps. I, I feel like as a writer, you make a kind of bargain with your reader, and you're asking your reader for something. You're asking your reader to pay attention to you. And in return, you have to give this reader some semblance of the world, and not and get certain things right so that even though we all know this is a fiction, you know, there's this kind of suspended disbelief while you read it that it could be real, it's almost real. And you hold those two things in your mind as you read. So if I, as your author, write something about a place and I get something horribly wrong, like uh, a street that couldn't possibly be there in a dress or some, some feature about it. I mean, it is fiction. You get to make certain things up. But I'm going to lose your trust. You're not going to believe anything else I tell you either. So I felt Great Neck would be suitable. It was, it was accessible to New York. And it would have you know, these, these things I could, it, what I didn't know I could fill in. I had been there. I had some sense of it, some, like the smell of it, I like to say. I need to know what it smells like before I can write about it. And then there were also, then it just so happened, I didn't intend this, but because it could have been Larchmont or it could have been Scarsdale. I had some friends there. So those, those are 
nice places that are accessible, you know, from New York as well. Um, but Great Neck, it had the literary illusion with the Great Gatsby, and it had this, to me, a kind of aspirational quality that I liked, that it was a place people wanted to go to or live in. They didn't necessarily get there. And some of the characters in this book do, and some don't, and some kind of disdain it, and some long for it. But I, I, it was that longing that interested me, and I felt like the place had that. And so I would put it there. And I feel like it was, you know, it has served me well. I felt happy with it. I felt like it was properly rooted and situated in, in the world. So with having said all that, I would love to read some of it. Um, Lenore realized she'd better start thinking about that. 
She was not wearing the watch, so she did not know the time. But Shirley was getting late, and she was having no luck finding Justine. She was annoyed by her failure. Failure always hurt. Yet she wasn't, there wasn't much more she could do. Justine could be anywhere out here, or not here at all. Lenore still wanted to try to speak to Caleb, and then there was that matter of doing both her hair and getting dressed. Betsy had planned for some pre-wedding photographs. Plus, Lenore realized that she was a bit winded from her walk. She might actually need to take a teeny tiny nap before the evening's festivities. The dense trees had thinned out, and the wind was stronger, yanking on the little umbrella and turning it inside out. Lenore fought with it valiantly, but the wind was stronger than she was. A rude gust snatched the thing up and sent it skittering, broken and useless, beyond her reach.